Hello, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Q&A show. I'm uh, speaking in a little somber tone at the moment because there has been an incident, a shooting in Vienna, and uh, we do want to uh, ask our viewers to pray for those who have been injured and those who have been shot dead. Uh, it happened uh, sometime this evening, and uh, it seems that uh, there's this incident took place near a synagogue. Whether or not it was directly uh, directed at the synagogue or not remains to be seen, but unfortunately people have lost their lives tonight again in what is deemed to be a terrorist incident. So let me just start by saying that because Le Revelation TV uh, is always going to be here for live situations and before we start this program which is uh, going to be one that's going to be very informative for you as a, as a believer in the Lord but can't always give the defense of your faith uh, in, a, in a, a, a way which would other people would understand that the Bible is historically and scientifically uh, very plausible and uh, will help you to help others to understand that there is a God. I want to say uh, welcome to Ellie, first of all. Ellie's the lady who actually uh, introduced me to tonight's guest, who's uh, Professor uh, John Lennox, and we'll be uh, meeting him in a very short manner. Uh, can I just say, Ellie, well done for bringing this particular gentleman to our screens. Thank you. A little bit about him. He's so, Professor John Lennox, we interviewed him uh, in lockdown. And he's an author as well, so he's written many books. And one of the books we interviewed him about was Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Um, so he's a very well-respected man, and we're very lucky to have him on tonight. OK. Well, we're going to start, really, uh, with the uh, trailer for the particular film that's going to be coming out, um, uh, Against the Tide. Let's have a look at this, and then we'll be introducing Professor John Lennox. Why there is something rather than nothing is a huge question today. Belief in God does not really help us. Religion teaches us to be satisfied with not really understanding. I believe the exact opposite. God, far from being a delusion, is real. Religion is a fiction that just is never challenged. I believe that the public need to hear that there is another side. And that's why I'm here too, to have you help me to understand and follow the evidence. I do argue that there is evidence for the existence of an intelligent God behind the universe. Christianity answers the question, who is this God? How do we know that God came here? In, in basically human form. How do we know that? Why don't we meet in the place where it all began? What about the, uh, the resurrection? Now, I don't normally need five minutes to uh, rebut the resurrection. The resurrection possesses unrivaled explanatory power. John, I sense that you truly believe this. I'm convinced of it, not simply as a Christian, but as a believing scientist. Just to remind you, Q&A is all about you asking the questions for tonight. And I just want to remind you that you can do that by sending emails to live at revelationtv.com and also uh, SMS texts as well. Ellie will be reading those out as we introduce the uh, tonight's special guest. But before we do that, I just want to show you this particular scripture and share it with you because it's something that stuck very much in my mind as I was starting to read the Bible. I needed... I didn't have a problem with faith itself, but I wanted to know how to share my faith. And uh, this particular scripture spells it all out, makes it very clear. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Uh, but to do this, I'm reminded to do it with gentleness and respect. Now, I'm going to introduce you tonight to Professor John Lennox, who's live with us on our link, and he's the Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at Oxford University. Uh, good evening, Professor. Hello. 
Nice to be with you again. Yeah, well, thank you, John. Now, uh, that particular scripture always comes to mind when I have somebody like yourself on, because it, you, you are definitely the person that we can ask, how do we deliver our particular faith in our God in a way which people would easily understand and be able to take seriously? Because we don't have a problem with faith but we do have a problem sometimes in making defense of our faith. Well, I sometimes think that we do have a problem with faith in, in one sense, that uh, Christianity is something that is to be shared. And we run up to, against two barriers, and they're very common barriers, fear and shame. And... The background of this particular statement that you read is very interesting because it is the background of fear. Do not fear them, says Peter. Now, Peter himself was a man who, who got afraid, and therefore we listen to him carefully as he unpacks something that I have found throughout my life immensely encouraging. And the first major point I'd make about this uh, statement is that it is not talking about the ability to preach or preaching because the context of it is always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you. Now, that's not a preaching context. That is a one-to-one -one discussion or a small discussion. And, and so the issue is this. How can we encourage people to ask us questions? I was very bothered about this years ago as a student because I thought I was ready to answer the questions, but nobody ever asked me. And a younger student put me right on this, and I've never forgotten what he said. He said, well, have you ever thought of asking them I said, well, no. He said, why? Well, I said, they don't have a hope. He said, try asking them. So the very next time I was traveling on a train down to London and um, I noticed the man beside me was reading a scientific textbook and I asked him, was he a scientist? And he said he was. And he asked me what I was doing and I said, I'm an undergraduate studying mathematics. And then I took out a New Testament and started reading it, holding it so as he could see it. And of course, curiosity got the better of him after a while. And he said, uh, excuse me, he said, is that a New Testament you're reading? And I said, yes. And I kept on reading. And after a few more minutes, he said, look, he said, I don't want to be rude, but you said you were a mathematician. Why is a mathematician reading the New Testament? And I remembered what my friend had said to me. So I just looked at him. I said, tell me, I said, have you any hope? And he went as white as a sheet. And then he said, I guess we'll all muddle through. And I said, you know, I didn't mean that. My question was, has you, have you any personal hope? And he said, none whatsoever. Well, I said, that's why I'm reading the New Testament. And he asked well, what hope does it give you? So now I'd been asked the question, I could answer it. And, you know, I find this so helpful because many people, they think that we're called upon to be uh, preachers. We're not. We're called upon to be witnesses and ambassadors for Christ. And we are, we have the responsibility to stimulate people enough that they start asking us questions. Now, I can unpack that a great deal more uh, if and when you wish. Right. Well, let me let me just put it uh, into context of something, a conversation I had literally just a couple of days ago. Um, I play football with uh, quite a few of the people down here, expats, and one of the guys right at the end of our sort of having a little beer afterwards um, said to me, Howard, I hear you are a, a religious man. I understood what he meant, by the way. And uh, he said, he said, I'm a believer, but he waited for everybody else to go. <laughs> and uh, he said, but my daughter, who's in her 20s, 
uh, is not. She can't come to terms in believing in God. She said, you know, the, the Bible isn't historically correct, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and from a scientific point of view as well. And I said, well, look, I tell you what, find out, because I was trying to think very quickly what, how I can actually help to convince this man to convince his daughter that there is a God and the Bible is uh, 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 credible and also historically uh, correct in many ways in which we can actually talk about. So I, I put the question to him, find out from your daughter what it is exactly and pose, a, 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 if you like, a, a question or two as to what it is that she has doubts about in specifics. And so um, that's what, how I opened it up and I was sort of shaking in my shoes a bit that I didn't have to give a defense right there and then. Although I've been a believer since I was 21, which was a few weeks ago, you know, I'm only joking. But seriously, uh, what can we say to people today about looking at the scripture from say, um, uh, you know, just historically, people would say Christ was not a historical figure. And some of the early accounts, let's go back to the times of Moses and Abraham and, and the situations like that, or the kings of Israel. What is there there that can actually you could point out to us to help us as individuals to give a good account when we're asked to do so? You're quite right in trying to find out what the specific difficulty is because these generic questions are very difficult to answer. Yeah. I mean, there are about 10 questions packed in there. But I think to start with, on the historicity of Christ himself, you see, if people deny that, then the denial comes, and forgive me if I say it bluntly, because they've never read any ancient history. It is the fact that if you consult the experts on history, you find that by and large, they are completely convinced not only that Jesus existed, but they're convinced that many of the things that are written of him in the New Testament Gospels are accurate. Now, I say that because many of these historians are not Christians. They may even be agnostic or atheist, but the point is they know how to assess history. So someone who comes along to me and says, well, I think Jesus never existed. Well, that is, pardon me, sheer ignorance. And that can be settled by reading something serious on the topic. And uh, there's a lot of material, and you'll be aware of it as well as I am, but I think one of the most useful recent books is the one by Peter Williams, Dr. Peter Williams of Tyndale House in, in Cambridge. Can we trust the Gospels? Because you proceed from the historicity of Jesus to discovering that the gospel writers, and in particular Luke, who claims to be a historian and dates his gospel and tells you who was on the throne and all this kind of stuff, you can check uh, many checkable things in terms of parallel archaeological findings. And Luke has been shown to be correct on virtually everything that's checkable. And many very leading um, ancient historians have come to the conclusion that he is one of the most impressive historians from the ancient world. So I think these things can be cleared up by reading. But what I find often is the case, and not necessarily with your friend, but these questions are raised by people that do not necessarily want to engage with them because That's right. if Someone asked me that question. I said, have you read X, Y, and Z? And mm -hmm. they say, no. And I said, will you read it and we'll discuss it? Very often they say, oh, that's not my problem. Well, tell me what your problem is. And there are people with genuine questions about history. We need to answer those questions. But questioners are much more complicated than their questions. And we need to find out exactly where they're coming from. That's why when I hear questions like this, where a friend of a friend has asked a certain question, I say, look, I don't know these people. And everyone is different. And I think one of the things that Peter's telling us here is, uh, the subtext for me is that if you want to get people to ask you questions, 
you need to ask them questions, not questions necessarily about biblical things or spiritual things. But the way to get to know people, especially if you haven't met them before, is to ask them questions about their interests, about their families, about their background, about what makes them tick. And that will mean when they eventually ask you a question, and you might have to wait a while for that to happen, then you can take that seriously and give an answer. Now, it may be nothing to do with Christianity, but you'll get to know them as a friend and you'll get to know what is going on in their lives and in their minds. And it's when you know a bit more about that that you can answer these questions with much more accuracy. Yeah. Now, the questions are starting to come in from our viewers, but I just wanted to say in that particular trailer that we saw, uh, there was a mention there by, was it Christopher Hitchens? Uh, because obviously the late Christopher Hitchens. Um, yes. Because he actually was a little bit uh, arrogant there and saying, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need uh, more than five minutes to talk about the resurrection or <laughs> dispute <laughs> the, the resurrection yeah. of Christ. You know, so uh, those sort of things. I, I actually had Christopher Hitchens when we first launched Revelation TV writing to us. I didn't know who he was, to be honest, at that time. But uh, it, it didn't take him long, actually, to uh, for that to come to the surface. But I was uh, at least privileged to be able to argue a few points with him. Uh, we've got some emails coming in, Ellie. We do indeed. We've got one from Tony saying, Good evening, please. Professor Lennox, what is the best thing I could say to my friend who is a highly educated teacher and a science-based person and demands scientific empirical proof of the Lord? He is a good man who I would love to witness effectively too. Thank you. And that's from Tony. Well, it depends really on whether Tony is himself a scientist or not. And if he is, then he probably will know what to say. But if he isn't, what I say to people like that is to, and Tony, thanks for your question. It's an important question. If you're not a scientist, and many people watching may not be, what I say to them, look, and speaking personally, but you can use other people's books if you like, I have written a little book not long ago called Can Science Explain Everything? Now, that covers a lot of the ground, the questions that are normally asked. And what I suggest is you give your friend that book, but don't recommend it. Uh, what I mean by that is, if you say to someone, look, here's a book I think is terrific, please read it. Well, they, they won't. It's much better if you're not a scientist to be completely honest and say, look, I, I've got this book and it seems to be heading in the direction of dealing with your questions, but I'd like you to evaluate it for me and then we can perhaps discuss it. And that opens the conversation up. Recommending books is oddly unwise. I always encourage people to get others to evaluate them especially if they themselves are not qualified in the field. So that, that's how I would start to do that. And, and perhaps use one of the reasons that uh, we made this film is precisely to get that conversation going. Because half of its time it spends on science and half of its time it, it spends on the evidence for the truth of the Christian uh, faith. So that would be my first response to the question. I, th I think it's such an exciting time for this film to come out because when I saw the trailer, um, I think as Christians, I think we can shy away from um, facing questions about science because I think it's quite one of those subjects where I wouldn't feel confident answering that. Um, and it doesn't mean we necessarily have to answer it, but we can, as, as Professor Lennox says, we can give them um, a book and kind of leave it to them to, to look at it and decide. Um, and I think especially now where people are going through coronavirus and they are actually questioning their faith now and they're looking at it and going, actually, maybe there is something more. Um, it's such a phenomenal time for the film to be, to be airing. Mm. I think your point, your point, Ellie, is, is, is very, very important there. Mm. We'll never lose face by saying, look, we don't know. Exactly. And if you're not a scientist, to say to somebody, look, I'd love to know more about science, but I don't. Now, I would like you to have a look at this, if you will, and tell me what you think the problems are with it. 
But if you like, I can share with you something um, that science doesn't touch in the sense that it's, it's my own experience, if you'd like me to. Because it's very important for us who are believers to realize that nobody can take your experience of God away from you. Right. And also, science, as my book says, doesn't explain everything. It's not the only rational discipline around history is, and so are many other things. So there are all kinds of approaches, and you will not lose face by saying, look, I don't know. Well, let me come back to uh, what Christopher Hitchens was saying you do you, in his arrogant way, um, but let's take it seriously that because that could be a lot of people's um, argument is that the the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, the death and resurrection. Um, what proof do we have? Um, uh, we could actually say that Josephus obviously was a historian at the time who was fairly independent, although he was a Jewish uh, historian, but he did write quite critically about some of the things that happened around that time of Christ. But he also uh, did record the fact that this man did miracles in the land and also that his disciples uh, were doing such work as well. So there is some uh, credible historical record there. Um, is there anything else that you would say uh, to actually add to that? Well, this is very important that you bring to bear the contemporary evidence from other writers. Uh, Josephus is one of them. The Roman historian Tacitus is another one. Yes. And um, <clears throat> then there's Ben Serapion. And we have enough evidence from contemporaries that scholars of this uh, topic uh, agree that something happened. Uh, it's amazing that when it comes to resurrection, peace be to the late Christopher Hitchens, there's surprising agreement among historians. Think of some of those. They agree that Jesus was crucified, that he was laid in a known tomb, and they tend to agree that a few days later the tomb was found empty. And <laughs> Once you get that far, then you're faced with the question of how do we explain the empty tomb? And then there are all kinds of arguments come in and we can examine them forensically. We can't revisit to see exactly what happens, but we can use argument, what's called inference, the best explanation um, <clears throat> about the resurrection. And one of them, for example, is the fact that Christianity suddenly exploded out of a non-evangelizing religion, Judaism, and the rise of the Christian church must be explained by something. Now, what the early apostles claim is the resurrection. As C.S. Lewis puts it, if the resurrection hadn't happened, there would have been no Christianity. And then people argue various things. They say, oh, well, uh, maybe the disciples removed the body. Well, think about that. Here were people that went out to preach that Jesus rose from the dead, lived lives of uh, very impressive truthfulness, honesty, and integrity. How could they have done that if they knew that they had simply perpetuated a lie? And so it goes on. And there are many different avenues of approach to this. One of the very interesting things about the resurrection is some people who have seen that it is the central claim of the Christian faith and have decided, right, they're going to prove the resurrection didn't happen and so destroy the Christian faith they have ended up becoming Christians themselves. Mm -hmm. Or finally, there are many other things, but people say, oh, well, the, the appearance was a hallucination. But experts in psychology point out that we tend to hallucinate about things that we are expecting. And none of the disciples were expecting a, a resurrection. And of course, hallucination doesn't explain an empty tomb. We're dealing here, I believe, that with factual reality. And 
the reason I'm confident about this is I spent my life exposing my faith in Christ to its opposite, like Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins. And the more I encounter their kind of objections, the more convinced I am that their arguments simply do not work. And no naturalistic explanation works for the resurrection. And uh, so <clears throat> I stand firm by it, but you need to do it for yourself. You need to read the evidence for mm. yourself. Right, before we go to our next question, let me just reiterate there what something you uh, spoke about or mentioned is the fact that the apostles would not have laid down their lives willingly for a lie. That's the whole thing. And nearly every one of them, by all accounts, lost their life in a most uh, horrendous way as well. So they actually would not have done that, as you say, for a lie. Mm. But uh, lots of other things and questions coming in. Yes. And mm. um, we've got one from Dave here and it says, hi, folk, a very interesting subject. I have two questions for Professor Lennox. A, what does John think the reason would be why people like Richard Dawkins does not believe in God? And B, would disbelievers still have come about if God had not sent everyone from Babylon, allowing them to start other beliefs? I'm not sure that I understand the second, but let me take the first question. I cannot see inside the mind and heart of Richard Dawkins, and therefore I can't second guess what the problem is. What I would risk saying is, his arguments seem to me uh, to be increasingly incoherent, particularly in his book, The God Delusion. So uh, the problem can't be reason. And perhaps, I do not know, that he had a very negative experience with some Christians earlier in his life or some version of, of Christianity. I just do not know. There are so many reasons that highly intelligent people reject the Christian faith, but it hasn't always to do with reason and logic. So what was the second question? Um, just going back to it, it says, would disbelievers still have come about if God had not sent everyone from Babylon, allowing them to start other beliefs? I don't get that oh, one either, yeah. but I'm just wondering, Babylon the Great or Babylon the I, I think city? I understand what they mean. Mm. How, how would we know an answer to that? Uh, you see, <laughs> the development of all kinds of beliefs certainly may well have come about through a scattering of the nations, mm -hmm. uh, as described in uh, Genesis 11. But we can't second guess. Remember, that scattering came about because people were rebelling against God. The, the development of other religions had already started, and ancient Babel was at the heart of it. So I, I'm not sure where we're going with this question, really. You got other questions there? Yes, I do. I have another one here uh, from Ian. It says, hello, does Mr. Lennox believe that Dawkins will ever become a believer? And that's from Ian. Well, how would I be able to answer that? <laughs> Can um, I actually try I, and answer that, John? Because I actually met the man, and I, after the interview, which I did with him, which was a terrible interview because of uh, a death in the family had just occurred, and I was trying to deal with that. But when I spoke to him after the interview, I saw a different side of the man. And um, I've got to say, I would like to believe that he would become a believer. That's what I really feel in my heart, and I'm not saying that uh, without having done some due diligence and, uh, and some of the things that I've actually seen and heard since, I, w I would like to say he will become a believer. Well, I would like to <laughs> believe that many of my atheist friends would become believers. But as we know from history, uh, there's absolutely no guarantee. But I recall that the famous soul of Tarsus became a believer. There you go. And so <clears throat> I see hope for many other people. Yeah, there's been many uh, uh, 
prestigious people, even judges in America who uh, studied the, the Bible from, I can't remember the guy's name in particular, but he studied the Bible in order to disprove it. And you sort of alluded to that earlier on, John. And I think that these sort of people, uh, like Dr. Grady, he was mm -hmm. uh, um, one who believed in evolution. Mm -hmm. And after a year and a half of studying the scriptures, came to believe that, that we were created and not something that evolved and and, and that man has uh, is a very clever man indeed like yourself professor john so let's uh, believe that you know that you know the the power of god uh, and through the written word is what uh, actually changes the people's hearts and minds mm -hmm. question. Um, next question i have is from duncan hi professor can you give me an example of good maths in the bible that would help in evangelism I tutor in maths, so any formulae would be interesting. Good question. Well, I'm thankful that the Bible is not a textbook of mathematics. <laughs> uh, Me too, I'd be useless. <laughs> what about um, Daniel 9? Well, I would not... Uh, I'm, a I'm a pure mathematician, I study algebra. <laughs> That's the arithmetic of dates isn't what I would call mathematics. I think that there's nothing really that I would cite from the Bible in that way that gives evidence for God. I, I feel the evidence for God that comes from mathematics is very powerful, but it doesn't come in that way. In other words, if people ask me, does mathematics help me? Uh, to believe in God. I say it does absolutely because the amazing thing about mathematics is that we can use it to describe what's going on out there in the universe. And it was that belief that actually is behind the rise of modern science. Many people do not realize until I tell them or someone else tells them that modern science is really a gift of the Judeo-Christian heritage. C.S. Lewis put it beautifully when he said men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in the legislator. So for me, uh, the evidence that we can understand at least something about the, say, the motion of the planets or what's going on inside the sun is evidence that this is a rationally intelligible universe. In fact, all scientists have to start by believing that it's a rationally intelligible universe. And here, it seems to me that if you reject God, you don't have many reasonable grounds for believing that. Whereas what Christianity tells me is the reason that I can understand the universe a little bit using mathematics inside my head is because the universe and my mind are both created by the same intelligent God. So that's where I would go. I don't think that the, the Bible intends to give us various mathematical equations that give evidence for God in that way. Absolutely, great, great answer. Um, moving on, Mike says, do you think that atheists are in rebellion? Well, that's a generic question. Which atheists? Who are we talking about? <laughs> you, you'll find I'm very elusive when I'm asked about general things like that. Some atheists may well be in rebellion because if you think of the atheism of the Enlightenment, uh, the French Revolution and all this kind of thing, they were certainly in rebellion. And some people tell us that they are anti-God. And certainly that is rebellion against God. And therefore, how many are, uh, I don't know, but that some are. There are other people, you see, that aren't hardline atheists, nor are they militant or aggressive. And they would respect me and say, well, I'm entitled to believe what I believe and we can discuss it. And their atheism is of a milder sort. And they try to argue uh, reasonably about it. And you don't sense that they're in rebellion, but then you don't know. Because 
Christianity involves more than one dimension. What I mean by that is this. It's not simply a matter of X plus Y equals Z, therefore God exists. It's got a strong intellectual dimension. Christian faith is evidence-based faith as uh, is explained to us in the New Testament. There's evidence. If we want to really get a hold of that, we all we have to do is read John 20, where uh, we read this. Many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. In other words, John says, I've collected these signs, the miracles Jesus did. They are pointers to who he is, and they are evidence upon which faith can be based. So Christianity involves a rational, evidence-based faith in God. And that's very important for us to get across. Absolutely. Yeah. What about archaeological uh, evidence that's always emerging um, because a lot of the people that would actually go and do the digs, particularly in uh, Israel itself, and then uh, use the Bible accounts to actually find the tells, that's the mounds where all these things are hidden, and, uh, you know, find the, uh, the ancient, uh, if you like, uh, pottery or the buildings or the architectural work that was there. Um, and it, it seems that they want to use the Bible to find these places of interest, but don't give any uh, credence to the Bible itself. Well, I'm not an expert archaeologist, but I do read some of the stuff and uh, there's quite a lot of it out there. One person I found helpful to read is Professor Alan Millard and Professor Kenneth Kitchen. And uh, the evidence from archaeology for many things is, is very strong. In fact, just yesterday I came across an article, I think in the Biblical Archaeology magazine, saying that 53 names from the Bible, 53 persons that are mentioned have been independently verified by archaeological findings. And that, that kind of thing mm -hmm. is, is enormously important, it seems to me, because it corroborates uh, what the Bible says. One example that I remember from years back is that for a long time, people said that the book of Daniel was inaccurate historically because it mentioned King Belshazzar. And uh, so it was dismissed until an inscription turned up with his name on. I think I've got the right one there. And again and again, there has been confirmation. But then I'm not an expert. You need to turn to ancient historians uh, on this kind of question. Yeah. Um, you remind me actually there, John, of when I went to visit the British Museum, I was fascinated with all of the archaeological findings that they they brought into that particular museum and particularly when it talks about uh, in the bible Nineveh because uh, that wasn't something that was discovered for maybe like until about 200 years ago um, bible critics always used to say well where's this great city that's talked about uh, that Nineveh that Jonah went to visit and we've now got many cuneiform tablets and a lot of the uh, things that uh, were on, uh, found in Nineveh themselves gave credence again to some of the characters uh, and also the events that happened as mentioned in the Bible uh, as it being you know valid and uh, the and I was looking up about the Rosetta Stone tonight as well that was something uh, where this particular French man actually was able to work out uh, what the hieroglyphics were actually meaning, what the, the different signs like the bird and et cetera, what they all stood for. And he was the one who was able to bring the encoding or to, to, to give, a, if you like, a, a, a modern day language and terms to use for those particular findings. Uh, again, all of this uh, and some of them have direct bearing uh, to scripture as well. Well, this is a very good argument for encouraging intelligent young Christians to get into some of these fields. 
and make a contribution to them. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the title of the film is Against the Tide. I've written a book called Against the Flow, and it is actually about Daniel. And in order to write that book, I spent a lot of time studying the ancient Near East, particularly uh, Babylon. And it was just utterly fascinating. And I tried to increase the interest of my book by referring to a lot of these things and demonstrating that the issues that Daniel and his friends faced are in the University of Babylon were exactly the same as what students face. And if there are young people watching me, I wrote this book against the flow for people like yourself, who may be up against a secular worldview that's challenging your Christian faith left, right and center. Yeah, do you know, um, I, I like the book of Daniel. There are many things in there which are prophetic. I'm not sure where you stand on prophecy, but I found it extremely uh, helpful. And al also the, the experiences which Daniel had and how he was, if you like, used of God uh, to actually appeal to the kings um, and uh, actually be able to, if you like, minister to them at the same time, also uh, profoundly speak about the coming of the Messiah as well. Well, Daniel is a brilliant Old Testament example of the fulfillment of 1 Peter 3.16. There you go. That he witnessed to the emperor, and I believe that the first half of the book, uh, every chapter of it mentions Nebuchadnezzar. And it is the book of Daniel, but his witness to the king is, is one of the most important things. And you mention prophecy, which is very interesting because some Christians shy away from it because it has a strongly supernatural dimension. But so is Christianity, mm -hmm. as C.S. Lewis never tired of pointing out. But I think one of the central things that brings Daniel and Christ together is the fact that when he was put on trial and asked whether he was the Messiah, he said, yes, and you will see the Son of Man um, <clears throat> coming on the throne of heaven, uh, on the clouds of heaven. And everybody who was listening to him knew that he was quoting the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel had a vision of uh, a brilliant figure um, coming on the clouds of heaven. And that's why they crucified him. And I'm not remotely ashamed, therefore, of staking my claim that I believe that Daniel was looking down through the tunnel of the centuries and seeing an event that is yet to happen. And I have dealt with all that in my book. So in answer to your question, Mm. If you want to know where I stand in prophecy, read my book. Right. Well, it was prophecy for me that actually uh, was the most appealing. I read the scripture as, as a book uh, on, on my own, and it took me two and a quarter years um, to read it. And I, when I came across Daniel, I just was, uh, I was going to say I freaked out. But chap chapter 12, the very first verse there, talks about a time of great trouble. And uh, again, this is reiterated by Christ in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, that this time that the world would experience, which had never happened uh, before, or nor will it happen again to the same extent, actually points to the time, as you know, uh, when Christ will actually come again and take up his rightful place in the kingdom of God, which is mentioned in Daniel 2, chapter 44. So, you know, the prophecy is so important. I'm so pleased that you've actually born witness to that as well, because that's something that might appeal to other people, because me, I, uh, as a man, maybe not as a woman, in the sense that females might look at Christ and, go, and be in awe of him, whereas for me, it was the prophetic uh, from Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, all the way through to Revelation that really interested me. Anyway, yes, yeah. well, if you think of one Peter, go back to the statement you read. Uh, give a reason for the hope that is within us. What is the Christian hope? From the very first days, it was the ultimate hope was that Jesus would return. 
Amen. And publicly, he said to his judges that he would return. And privately to his disciples, he said, I go away, but I will come again to receive you to myself. So this is the Christian hope. And it seems to me to be very important to spell it out. It is, of course, manifestly supernatural, but so is the incarnation and the resurrection yep. and the miracles Jesus did. Brilliant. I just want to read some more emails because we've got loads coming in. Um, Howard began the program tonight with the news of the tragic killings that happened this evening in Vienna. How would Professor Lennox say to people who ask the question, why does God allow such tra tragedy to happen? That's the hard question. Uh, and it's the reason why I wrote my book, Why, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? All of us, whatever our worldview, find pain and suffering very difficult to cope with. And what I say to people is this. Before we judge the biblical view of this, we, we need to listen to it. And what the Bible tells us is there's a fatal flaw at the heart of human beings. Now, we haven't time tonight to go into the details, but if you have a look at my little book, where is God in a coronavirus world? You, you learn what, what I think about that. And the amazing thing about God's dealing with humans is that he doesn't turn us into robots. People often say, look, why couldn't God have made a universe in which events like the one tonight never happened? Uh, and why couldn't he have made creatures that never do things like that? Well, the answer to that is, of course, he could. But you wouldn't be in a world like that. Animals cannot sin and robots cannot sin. They simply do what they're programmed to do. But the magnificent gift that God has given us as human beings made in his image is he hasn't programmed us as robots. He's given us a genuine dimension of responsibility and freedom. And in order to have that, you've got to be able to choose yes or no. And what we see in the world is the evil that has come about because people choose to, to use your phrase, rebel against God. Now, uh, the big question that raises is, has God done anything about that to rescue people that have got into the mess? And that's where the cross and resurrection uh, come into their own. But let me just say that this is not a simple question. There are no simplistic answers. But I have made an effort in my little book to give you the beginnings of an answer. But if you want to listen to something, uh, may I just suggest you Google my name and New Zealand and you'll find my response to the earthquake that happened in 2011, meeting people who had suffered loss of their loved ones in that um, catastrophe when there was an earthquake. And uh, there I also deal with the problem of moral evil, which is evident on the streets of Vienna tonight. Mm. But the Christian message has got hope to offer to all of us because it believes in the resurrection, not only of Jesus, but of those that trust Christ. And therefore, we've got something that transcends death. Atheism has nothing to put alongside that. It is a hopeless worldview, mm. a hopeless faith. Can I just add that really, you know, one of the things that for me is that um, the scriptures give cl clarity on this because it, it says that the unrighteous will do the things and act more wickedly, particularly in the latter days. Christ said, because of the increase in lawlessness, uh, the, the love of many will cool off because we become afraid to, uh, if you like, to go out there. Uh, into the into the crowds but you know Jesus talks also about a time the future of this new heaven and new earth uh, in Matthew uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 21 no more pain no more suffering all the things which this world 
goes through right now will be gone forever uh, when this day arrives, which is when Christ's return. So it's not something that God wants. And in fact, he gave us the freedom, will, free will and choice. And uh, we are reaping what we've sown over thousands of years. And I just know that uh, our days are numbered in that sense. Uh, for those who believe, great hope for the future. For those who act wickedly, they will be cut off as Psalms 37 talks about. Yeah, I think I, I just want to say to Professor Lennox, if he can just say a, a couple of things to perhaps younger people, because for me, as soon as I saw this trailer, I was so excited. I was sending it to absolutely everyone because that is something I really struggle with. I, you know, when it comes to science, I'm a bit, you know, iffy. But there is a lot of young people out there at the moment that do believe in, you know, the scientists who are atheists. And I don't think Professor Lennox's side is heard enough and, and, you know, the Christianity side. So I think it would be great if you could just speak to the, perhaps all generations, but especially the younger generations, and as you mentioned, the young scientists, to really encourage them to watch this film. Well, one of the key questions, I think, is this, and it's where many people get hung up. They listen to an atheist scientist like Dawkins saying science can explain everything. And that is simply not true. And I give a very simple analogy to help them understand that. Suppose I ask the question, why is the water boiling? Well, it's boiling because heat energy is being conducted through the base of a kettle and is agitating the molecules of water, and so it's boiling. I could also equally well say it's boiling because I would very much like a cup of tea. Now, those are two explanations of the same phenomenon. One is a scientific explanation in terms of heat physics. The other is a personal explanation in terms of my desire, the desire of an agent. The two explanations do not conflict. They do not compete, they complement. And if we raise that to the level of the universe, I often put it this way. The God explanation no more competes with a true science explanation than Henry Ford competes with physics as an explanation for a motor car. We need both. And the confusion that is in the mind of Richard Dawkins and the late Stephen Hawking and others is that only the science explanation is valid, which is, is complete nonsense. And equally, they think the science explanation is the same kind of explanation as the God explanation. Well, to quote Richard Swinburne, one of my philosopher colleagues at Oxford, he said, science explains, but God explains why science explains. <laughs> and I think the important thing is that we live in a universe created by God in which science can be done. Scientists didn't put the universe there. God did. We try to understand it and study it. And I think a great deal of confusion lies, as I try to explain my little book, in confusion over the nature of explanation. Now, there are many other things I could say. Uh, shall I say one more thing? Yes, please do. Yes. We've got a minute left. <laughs> Okay, well, the other thing is there's very great confusion about the nature of faith because the new atheists led by Dawkins have redefined faith to be a religious term, which means believing where there's no evidence. Now, that is dangerously wrong. The English word faith comes from the Latin fides, from which we get fidelity. It has ideas of trust and so on. Now, I've explained earlier that the faith that uh, Christianity tells us to develop is evidence-based. We trust in Christ for reasons. But many